All right, thank you so much, Dr. Tong, um, for that introduction. As you can see here, you may notice that this is a very familiar view, and it is. It's actually, this photo was taken yesterday at the, um, the patio right outside. And um, so I, my, top, my topic today and my talk today is a continuation of uh, Dr. Tong. Dr. Tong is my teacher. He was my math teacher in high school, and we, of course, both come from Concordia International School, Shanghai. You'll see me boasting a lot about my high school here as well. Um, but as a continuation, I'll be attending UC Berkeley this fall. In fact, I'll be moving into my dorm next Thursday. And so uh, just in case you haven't figured it out yet, I just graduated from high school. And uh, what I bring to this table is a unique perspective on how I want to be taught data science, how I wish I were taught in the er area of big data analytics. So, the topic for today, for my talk in particular, is big data in senior year. Because I was fortunate enough to be teaching a class of seniors uh, alongside with Dr. Tong's guidance at Concordia. And uh, it becomes very apparent to me today that uh, there's a question we're all tackling here. And that's the question of education. How do we teach this topic to students, right? Because it seems like where there are big companies, such as Target, there is big data. Where there's medicine, there is big data. Where there's law, there is big data. It seems as if with every new technological development, big data is at the core of its discovery. And what's more is that we'll be soon using data analysis to be tackling the world's biggest problems as well, such as global warming. Um, and you know, data science is amazing. Big data analytics is, has many, many applications. Although it can't paint the next Picasso's uh, st still life under the lamp, it can save lives, such as uh, Dr. Ca Caroline McGregor from University of Honorado Institute of Technology in uh, partnership with IBM has shown us. She was able to discover the patterns and trends of uh, preemies or premature babies in order to figure out whether or not they, they had the flu or whether or not they were about to be stri stricken down with the disease. So big data can save lives. And the question that we're all dealing with today is all, always about the demand for data scientists. So we've, ha we've heard a lot about this already, and so I'm not going to go into big depth into this as to say that, uh, but McKenzie and Company, this company has rated that uh, in the end of 2015, actually, there will be a demand for 140,000 data scientists in the United States alone. So there's no denying that data science is important. And when there is, uh, when, when you study the area of data science, when you're dealing with uh, numbers and figures, uh, you need managers as well. And so according to the McKinsey uh, study as well, there's 1. Million, 1. 1.5 million data managers that are in need uh, for 2015 as well to, to help with the data scientists. So again, there's no denying the recent rise and prominence of data science in all aspects of life. And we often look towards university. By the way, anybody can guess where this beautiful photo was taken? Yes? Yes, Berkeley. What a lovely place, I know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we, we often look towards university for help, right? As a company, we'll say, oh, you know, uh, the universities will take care of it, and um, somehow, you know, they'll train out the, the, the students we'll need in order for our company. But it, it's not necessarily the case, right? Although, uh, that being said, I do want to note six universities here that have, been, uh, that have been recently published for having a data mining or data science major. So this is very new. You know, out of the thousands of universities in North America, we have six and, and some, uh, some more, uh, that have you know, either data mining as a major from Stanford or University of California in San Diego or predictive analytics from Northwestern. So I do want to mention that there are these six universities. But that brings me to Concordia, my high school, you know, my alma mater. And what we wanted to do with creating a one semester math elective big data course for the high school level. 
we are all exposed to the realm of big data analytics. Google is able to figure out what websites and web pages to promote to us by looking at our previous, our history of web searches. Facebook is able to show us which groups and friends uh, to connect us by looking at our previous social trends. And Amazon is able to figure out what kind of books we like to enjoy and uh, by looking at our previous search history. And so there's no denying that we are constantly being exposed to big data at um, an international level, right? And so that becomes the first point of uh, the core of the lessons that were taught. So that's exposure. The next I want to focus on, and this is my, uh, my takeaway from how the course was taught, a little different from Dr. Tong's, is protection. Now I, as a high school student recently graduated, I want to be able to know how to protect my data. But that is very hard for me to do. In fact, uh, Facebook just recently updated its privacy settings in order for it to be more accessible for average users who don't even know that there are many features uh, to protect themselves um, on Facebook. And so protection becomes a key question and a key application in uh, this this new course. And lastly, of course, is awareness. We want to be more data aware. We want to know that there is this system out there. So for today's talk, for my talk today, I want to uh, break it up into three parts. First is how the course was taught. The second is case studies, and we'll get to that in a moment. And the last is future prospects. So the course focused on conceptual learning and application theory behind big data analytics rather than explicit formulas and technical jargons. The main objective for this course was to create awareness as you all know, and the type of exposure to the realm of, of big data that can point out hidden dangers. Of course, upon completing this course, uh, it is my hope that you know, the students will go on to continue this data analytics path in university and beyond. But uh, that is why we have such an overwhelming representation from the university level here today. But a student should understand why he or she wants to learn the subject before you bombard them with all these technical jargons, right? We first need to inspire the students to understand why he or she needs to learn this rather than, being, rather than forcing them into a subject they may not even know about. And so, again, um, you, may know, we, you may notice many similarities between our talk. We use the textbook, a revolution, Big Data, a revolution that will transform how we live, work, and think. And, um, we split it up into a few parts, into 10 parts. So we begin with introduction and overview. I believe that speaks for itself. Uh, we sort of, we started off with a very easy topic with Google and how Google was able to analyze search terms to correlate it to flu trends, which was able then to help prevent uh, the H1N1 disaster in the United States, which is, this is a very prominent topic. It caught everyone's interest. I know it caught mine, uh, which is why I really enjoyed this book. Um, and then the second is case studies, which is apparently, uh, is very apparent throughout the entire book, right? Uh, with every chapter, there are many case studies where you can dive into the specifics. And then we talked about the volume of data, you know, how do we collect mass amounts of data and what can we do with even little data, right? Because little data when analyzed well can also mean, can also show us amazing stories. Then there's the messiness of data, correlation versus causation, datafication versus digitalization, the difference between the two. Um, actually, it's a, that's a very key difference where digitalization is me, for example, take, taking a photo of one of, the, one of the pages of the book, but in order to datify it, I need to know what the words actually are, you know? Uh, have the computer know which, what words are being said where and um, so on and so forth. And then there's value in data, uh, implications of data, risks and control of data. I know we talked a little bit about ethics uh, previously, and I, I want to talk a little more about that uh, with the risks and control section of the book. And lastly, we talk about beyond big data. How can we use the theories and applications that we learn from the many examples in this book into our own lives? So each, each unit, out of the 10 units was split up into three sections, three lessons, so to speak. 
So each of the lessons had, uh, was taught in a day, and it usually boiled down to this. It was a general, and then there's a past, and then there's a present. So let's take the unit of correlation, for example, one of my favorite units. For the general uh, lecture, we'll talk, we talked a little bit about Amazon and how Amazon was able to correlate finds uh, for, us to, for us to purchase in the future. Now, is that causation? That's a different question, right? And so that brings us to the past. With what the past has to offer is illum uh, illusions and illuminations. So whether or not correlations are exactly causations, right? And I don't know if you can see the chart down there. Uh, there is a graph that uh, Harvard psychology professors were asking the question, you know, is, is the correlation between more money, is, it, is there a correlation between money and happiness? And turns out, you know, after many studies, uh, there is in the beginning. Right, that's the key part. Right, uh, in the beginning, you know, the correlation is uh, one to one. But then, after after you get a certain amount of money, after you obtain a certain amount of wealth, that number, the amount of happiness begins to trail off, and uh, it it becomes no longer a correlation. So we need to take a look at that, right, uh, in, in order to understand what we can do in the future, which is the uh, which is usually the last lesson in the three part series. So in this case, uh, we, talk, we ask the question, you know, is this the end of theory, right? Because if we can just attribute every question to an answer, right, um, there was, you know, the Turner test, right? Alan uh, Turing, sorry, the Turing test. Alan Turing, the founder of uh, computers, he, he said that, you know, the day we are able to, uh, enable to distinguish between uh, computers and human, the day we figure out artificial intelligence, that'll be the day when uh, we're talking to this computer and we're asking it questions and it's responding as if it were human. And we won't be able to distinguish whether or not we're talking to another human being on Skype or whether or not we're just talking to a computer. Um, and one of my professors at Berkeley actually rose a question to that theory, right? Because what if we were able to amass a huge database, an infinite amount of uh, answers to questions, would that still be artificial intelligence? Would that still be enough, uh, would that still be enough of our mindset in a computer for it to be considered intelligent, for it to be even considered a form of consciousness? And so uh, we talked a little bit about this for the end of theory and at the end of each unit, there are student presentations. And this is one of my favorite parts because uh, students are asked to create their own presentations and summarize the entire uh, unit in their own words. And, and this is the most important part, to find a new case study to present on. So in the technological world, I understand that you must be skilled in the STEM fields, right? Because or else, you know, what, what do you have to say for yourself, right? But one must also be able to present correctly and confidently. So by allowing students to not only reflect, but also analyze what they're learned through presentations, students are able then to attain the required skills to lead at what they do. Because I know for, I know for a fact that CEOs and the leaders of big companies today, they don't have the, they don't have the time and luxury to go over nitty details and, and all, the, all of the euphemisms and the uh, technical jargon with you. You need to be able to pitch your idea to them correctly. And so public speaking is a very important skill that I hope um, all my students and, and friends actually, so to speak, because we were all uh, from the same grade level, uh, were able to do a little better uh, with their own presentations. So let's actually take a look at one of my friend's presentation, Alex Gu, uh, and we're, we're, let's look at unit four, datafication. You know, a very solid uh, topic and a very important topic when it comes to the realm of data science. We begin with the importance of datafication. We talk about Matthew Fontaine Mori and how he was able to datafy um, all of the ship records and, and figure out new transit lines across the Atlantic. And that's how our, uh, the first telephone cable between North America and Great Britain was laid. 
And so he talked more about datafication versus digitalization, wonderful study, uh, one, wonderful summary of the unit uses of data. And then he begins to talk about more on geolocation and GPS. This is where the extrapolation bit comes, right? And uh, I'm glad this is a great tie into Mr. Richard's uh, presentation just a few minutes ago. Right? And then he extrapolate, extrapolates, extrapolates sorry, uh, it even further into law enforcement and GPS. And we have very current uh, events such as using the Memphis Blue Crush team where you know, we're using predictive analytics to help prevent crime. And so this, is, this was his extrapolation, right? And we, as, as, as teachers, we didn't even know about this topic prior to him presenting. And so that's the beauty of this. That's the beauty of student presentations is that not only are they reteaching the course material, we're all listening it again and again. And so we get a really firm grasp as to what the entire unit was about, but also we're learning something new. And I believe that the best teachers are often uh, the ones who are beside us, our peers, our friends, right? Um, and so Obviously, since this is a class presentation and an academic presentation, you have to cite your sources. And this is not just for the benefit of the presenter, um, but also for the benefit of those who want to research it some more, right? And so I was actually able to go on these links and do a little bit more research by myself on the Memphis Blue Crush team and um, how they were able to reduce crime through data an uh, analysis. And another thing I wanted to mention for uh, how the course was taught was basically that we were able to invite live speakers, obviously not fly them into Shanghai, although that would be amazing if you know, our school could finally get the, the fees taken care of, but uh, we were able to do live stream. And it, there were a lot of, a lot of uh, technical problems with that, uh, for example, time zone being one. Um, but we were very fortunate enough to have Professor Nitesh Chala on your right from University of Notre Dame and then Professor Vijay Khatri from University of Indiana on your left uh, speak live to us from, you know, from their universities in the morning. So we came in very early in the morning at 5.40 a.m., right? Um, and as seniors, very hard to do. Um, but uh, I, I decided, you know what, might as well make it fun, right? So we threw like a little breakfast club party. Uh, Dr. Tom baked pancakes for us. We brought in bacon and all of that. It was fun. And we were able to have a live stream. A professor from one of the best universities in the world talked to us about uh, the field of study and a lot of practical reasons uh, and applications from that. And so it was very, like, at first I thought, you know, what if, what if my friends wouldn't like it? You know, what if it's too early, and it, by all means, it was way too early. Um, but it turned out to be one of the most eventful experiences for us, and I was very glad that uh, these two professors took time out of their, out of their very busy teaching uh, schedules to, to help teach us. And now I want to talk about case studies, um, something that Dr. Tong had, didn't get the chance to dive into, right? So we were able to work with our middle school PE department and analyze their data because our PE, our middle school is actually very unique in, in the way they teach PE. Every student is hooked onto an iPod, you know, a touchscreen iPod, and they're able to track using the iPod how many steps the, uh, the student did. Uh, and after each class, each student inputs uh, the amount of time uh, in zone into the iPod and, and uh, whether or not they, they like the course or whether or not they like the activity. And so we're collecting a lot of, a lot of data from our students and a lot of data that we didn't even know uh, was being collected until uh, we started this course and one of the PE teachers came up to us and like, you know, I really want to figure out a new way to grade my students, right? Because PE grading hasn't really changed since all the way back in the 60s when it was first introduced. It was just, hey, that kid runs fast. Okay, he probably gets an A, right? But how much does that really tell us? How much does it tell us about how, how hard he worked in order to deserve, uh, in order to achieve that time, right? He could have been the slowest in the class and then achieved the fastest time. That would have been a deserving of an A. But what if he was always fit and, in fact, didn't improve at all during the semester? Does he still deserve an A? 
So why not use data? Why not use the most unbiased form of, of uh, grading available in order for our advantage? And so that's what we did with our uh, big data, uh, well, with the P project. Uh, we used Excel sheets, Excel formulas to actually form grades for our middle school students. And then the second case study I want to highlight is using the IBM retail challenge, um, understanding how business models work, right? Because we were able to, again, uh, travel to the IBM's China Development Labs to work with uh, the, the software engineers there and see how they are able to promote business ideas, business models using data analysis. And so each student was given 18 weeks of data to work with, and from there on out, uh, there was a simulation where in the retail world, uh, you get to choose, you, it's as if you own your own Starbucks, right? And you get to choose what price for the coffee, what price for uh, the filters, and how you want to sell that. And so we were able to really get a first world, real world account on how to use this data um, effectively for profits and for revenue. And lastly, I want to talk about future prospects. Uh, and I believe that this is the most important part, especially when it comes to K through 12 education. The lesson plan worked out perfectly in terms of division of units and lessons. You know, the three part lessons for each unit gave students a good grasp of information taught. The end of unit presentations turn out to be a great way, the best way, in fact, to end a unit segment. And as Cassie, uh, she's the lovely lady in, in the stripes on the right, uh, she said that the unit presentations we did after each unit were actually very beneficial. At first, it didn't seem like it would be helpful, but since it forced us to be able to present on our topic, we had to have a good understanding of it. It also helped us with our presentation skills. And so she'll be going to University of Notre Dame uh, this coming fall as well. And the PE project turned out to be a huge success. You know, our, our school, Concordia's PE teachers now use the Excel sheet, our formulas to co uh, that the big data class created in order to grade their students. And so Alex Gu, seated right next to me on the right, uh, he said that the PE project gave me a really interesting opportunity to apply all the concepts we learned during the class to a real large set of data. It allowed me to create a concrete application of the very abstract concept that is big data analytics. And he'll be attending UC uh, LA this coming fall as well. So there were many, uh, there were just as, these were just a sum of the many positive outcomes from the course. And as with any pilot course, there's room for improvement. Since it was just a one semester course, and unfortunately it still is going to be a one semester course, at times some of the materials felt rushed. And I understand that. You know, standing in front of the students, standing up there, talking a lot about uh, going through each lecture, going through each slide, I, I get that it's going a little too fast. Um, but unfortunately, all of that content, you know, how do you fit one, one field worth of content into one semester? Um, that's still going to be a problem that we have to face uh, with the upcoming semester. But I believe now that we were able to teach one semester of it, uh, we'll be much better prepared to handle, you know, to pace ourselves and to make sure that we get all the core content, at least, covered extensively. So, in conclusion, it's truly been a blessing for me to teach at a high school level. You know, not a lot of kids can come up to you and say, I was able to teach a class in high school before I even went to college, right? And um, I, I've been deeply humbled by this opportunity. And every day when I go up in front of a class to teach, it feels so surreal, right? Because um, I'm their friend to begin with, but now I have to act as their teacher. They look up to me and they expect me to know my, uh, to know the knowledge that I, 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 they expect to be expound on them. And looking back at, back at this entire experience of teaching the high school big data class, one thing becomes increasingly evident. There needs to be more classes like this in our other schools, in public schools, private schools, international schools, around the world. The positive feedback from the students shows that big data education needs this kind of advancement 
in order to keep up with today's time and culture. And so just as how we look back to the Apollo landing as an era that galvanized you know, a generation of scientists, mathematicians, and uh, data analysis, we too must look towards our own future and, um, and really try to inspire our students of this generation to look up to the stars and be curious, right? Because curiosity is what ultimately separates us from machines. A machine can do math much better than us. A machine can analyze data much better than us. But it is our curiosity and our willingness to always look for new answers, always try to ask these new questions, and always look up to the stars as a way of trying to figure out what the whole meaning of all this, what the meaning of life is. That's what makes us different. And so I want to, I want to leave with the note of saying that Please try and inspire your students, just as how um, scientists may say, oh, we, you know, we need to combat global warming, and that's how we inspire the students. You know, biologists may say, oh, why don't you can be the next person to find the cure for cancer. You can save millions of lives. We too need to look at data science as a, and figure out a way to inspire our own students to take on this challenge and to pursue it into into the vast future that holds much more promise. So, thank you. Uh, I was wondering if there are any questions. Do we have any questions for uh, William there? I know I went through a lot and it's, it's pretty rushed, but yeah. Thank you. Um, I actually, I remember being on stage, not this particular stage, but last year at Las Vegas, um, I was actually very nervous because uh, here I was in front of, again, um, in front of, you know, PhD doctorates, professors of uh, distinguished universities, and um, I, I didn't even graduate high school, so it was a little surreal, but, um, you know, I, I, I was very fortunate, again, uh, to be able to teach. And um, that entire experience has taught me in return. And uh, during the last lesson, I, don't, I, I hope Dr. Tong remembered, uh, but during the last lesson, I, I, I talked about each one of my friends. And uh, you know, I said, you think that throughout this entire semester, I was the one teaching you. But in, in actuality, you guys were the ones who were teaching me, you know, teaching me about perseverance, teaching me about determination, teaching me also about how much I didn't know. And that was the most important part um, for uh, the, the lectures and the discussions, was knowing how little I knew about this uh, field um, and how much more I need to learn for years to come at, the, uh, at university and at graduate school. Hopefully, yeah. Well, um, I'll actually, so I'll be attending UC Berkeley this fall, and my major as of right now is engineering, mathematics, and statistics, and I hope. I can also double major in computer science as well. So um, that's very exciting for me. I also know it's also very hard courses. Uh, but you know, I'm excited to, to begin this new chapter. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, um, next year I'll be revamping it a little bit, but I'll still be using the guide on the site method. But it all depends on the type of uh, students that I'll be getting. Because at Concordia, my personal teaching philosophy is like, I can have a lesson plan, I can have my entire year's 
plan all worked out. But the moment I see my students, everything can be out the window. So what I normally do is I assess the students in the first week and I cater to them, whatever that will bring out the colors in the students. So it all depends on the clientele that I will have. And then if there is a strong speaker, presenter, I will definitely have the student to do a peer teaching again. It all depends on what group of students I'll be getting for next year. Thank you. I'm not sure we actually have time for this. Do we have time?